Hey everybody and welcome to Breaking Biotech. Thanks for being with me here today. My name is Matt and if you like the show you can help out by clicking the like or subscribe button. You can also donate using the Patreon link in the description below. So I'm thrilled to be back and I've got a great show for everyone today. I'm going to be talking about three different companies. We're going to start with Shattuck Labs, move into ALX Oncology, and then finish up with Biogen. If there's time, we'll also talk about Curis, which I think is a huge opportunity right now. But I want to focus on these three companies because they've had some major news come out in the last little while. And now, with all the conferences that have come out, Sitsi and Ash Abstracts, there has been a ton of news, and I can't possibly cover it in today's episode, but I'm going to focus on these three stories um, because I think they're particularly interesting. So that's how the show is going to go today. And then I think next episode I'll do another follow-up on another three companies that recently had some pretty big news, but we're going to start there. And I'd like to apologize for my recent absence in the last little while. I have had some family visiting from Canada, so it's been fun entertaining them, but I haven't been as glued to the charts as I normally am. And frankly, the way the XBI has gone lately, it uh, has been for my mental sanity to not have to watch the charts all day. But with that comes a lack of production of the wonderful Breaking Biotech. So I'm glad to be back to be with all of you. And I want to thank everybody. I appreciate all of the support that I get. All of the engagement has been great. So continue to do that and it will help with the numbers. And if the numbers are good, then I can get fantastic guests like the recent CEO I had on, John Houston from Arbanus. So if you like the show, please continue to do that. And with that, let's get right into it. The first company I want to talk about, Shattuck Labs ticker symbol STTK, and they traded on Friday the 19th at $9.4 a share, giving them a market cap of only $400 million. And I put next to this the peak that was recently achieved. They were at $19 a share, or about a $900 million market cap on November 8th. And then with all this news that has come out, they have dropped to more than 50% of their peak market cap here, their recent peak market cap. Their Q3 net loss was $17 million, and their net current assets sit at $280 million, giving them an enterprise value of $120 million. And what Shattuck is trying to do is develop this agonist redirected checkpoint platform, is, is how they're calling it, and this is to enhance receptor engagement. So in a nutshell, how I would describe it is they're trying to build these multimodal molecules that can target multiple different binding sites and target them stronger. So it's not going to be just one anti-CD47 molecule, it'll be like 12, all combined into one molecule. And what Shattuck will argue is that they can get better engagement, they can get stronger binding, more receptor occupancy. But the downfall of this is that these molecules are extremely large. They're, I have here, they're around eight times bigger than IgG, which is just standard antibody where the molecular weight comes in at around 700 kilodaltons compared to 150 kilodaltons for IgG or, or standard uh, monomodal binding antibody. So I took a position in the company because they were looking at solid tumors, which is a very lucrative, very big market. So it would be great if they could see some success here. And I knew going into it that the fact that the molecules were very large could preclude them from having any activity because this is a story that we hear over and over again that antibodies and larger molecules aren't able to penetrate the solid tumor. So whatever activity the molecule has is pretty much worthless in a variety of solid tumors because that molecule can't get in there to do its work. So I posited that maybe the fact that the stronger binding associated with these ARC molecules might be able to overcome the limitations of size, just in the sense that maybe they can get very strong immune cell activation outside the tumor and that might allow these molecules to have some activity. It was a bit of a long shot and I knew that going into it. But the two molecules that they have in the clinic, one is SL172154 and this is in phase one for ovarian cancer. And this molecule is an SIRP alpha FC, and then CD40L. So the active portions of this molecule is SIRP alpha, which will bind to CD47, and then CD40L, which is used to activate the T cell in some manner. So anti-CD47, which will act as a sort of checkpoint inhibitor because CD47 does prevent macrophages from 
uh, attacking a certain cell and cancer cells overexpress CD47 to overcome the immune detection. So that's what this molecule is going to be used for. And then the next molecule is SL279252, and this is in phase one for advanced solid tumors. This molecule is a PD-1 FC and then OX40 ligand. PD-1, as we know, is a checkpoint inhibitor, and then OX40L is another means of activating T cells. So the company came up with these two molecules that have a dual function. One function is to block a sort of checkpoint, and then the other function is to activate T cells. And so the recent news that we heard was in this press release, Shattuck Labs announces preliminary clinical data from ongoing phase one clinical trials of arc fusion proteins, SL154 and SL252. I'll just use those last three numbers to refer to these molecules. And so they say that SL252, which is the PD-1 OX40L, demonstrates anti-tumor activity and evidence of dose-dependent immune activation in heavily pretreated checkpoint experienced patients. Then SL154, they say, demonstrates high CD47 target occupancy and CD40 engagement and evidence of dose-dependent immune activation in heavily pretreated platinum-resistant ovarian cancer patients. The company then says that they have submitted an IND for clinical trial of SL154 in AML, as well as high-risk MDS. And then the last point that they make here is that Shattuck and Takeda mutually agreed to terminate a collaboration agreement where Shattuck will now regain the rights of the clinical stage product SL252. So Takeda and Shattuck had a collaboration agreement for the PD-1 OX40 ligand molecule. And upon the release of this data, Shattuck is announcing that Takeda and them wanted to mutually terminate the collaboration. This never really bodes well for a molecule, but it is what it is. So let's get into the actual data. And I'm first showing the uh, plot of efficacy for SL252, the PD-1 OX40L. And this shows the change in tumor size from baseline. And we can see here that there's a few patients that seem to respond, but most of them really don't. Most of them tend to progress, and if nothing else, there is some stable disease, but largely they're not seeing a ton of activity here. They say that the best response was one confirmed partial response in ocular melanoma in a subject who remained on treatment for over a year. And then within 12 stable disease patients, they saw one unconfirmed partial response in a CPI experienced subject with vulvar melanoma. So two melanoma patients seem to be responding here, whereas the rest are either stable disease or progressive disease. So if we tally up all the patients that receive some of this molecule, they got one or two responses out of 43 Patients total, this is like a 2% objective response rate. 12 out of 43 had stable disease, which is 28%. And then if you add those two together for a disease control rate, we're looking at around 33%. So overall, I don't think the street was super excited about this data. Seeing only one or two responders in 43 patients is not very high. Now, if you look at the different treatment regimen here, and I'm trying to spin this in the most positive light because I do have a small position in the company, you know, patients that received level one and two and three are, are suboptimal treatment doses, so we don't really expect them to have received any clinical benefit here. But if we focus on, say, level seven, eight, nine, or 10, this is more clinically relevant dosing that we might want to focus on those if we want to get a sense on whether or not there is any activity of SL252 in these patients. And also keep in mind, they're heavily pretreated, they're very difficult patients to work with, and it's a basket of different cancers. So they're seeing some kind of bias towards melanoma, but it is only two patients. It is only a partial response. So uh, I'm reaching and I realize that when I'm trying to spin this in a positive light. But if we focus on the top three doses, so the six milligram per kg dose, three milligram per kg dose, and one milligram per kg dose, the highest dose that they've given so far, it's been in four different patients. And of those four, one of them had a greater than 30% change from baseline. And I took this from the graph before. With the three mg per kg dose, nine patients were treated. One out of nine had a greater than 30% change from baseline. And then in the one mg per kg dose, 12 patients have been treated so far. And one out of those 12 had a greater than 30% change from baseline. So if we add all of that up together, we're looking at three out of 25 patients that had a greater than 30% change from baseline, which if we 
assume that those could be objective responders in the future. We're looking at around a 12% objective response rate, which is a lot better than 2%. And I realize this is a big reach, but I wonder if there is any potential here if they do get to therapeutic dose levels. And I understand that this probably is due to the fact that the molecules are too large to penetrate the tumor, but there's a little bit of activity. So I wonder if there's something going on here. And for me, I'm willing to kind of hold out and see what's gonna happen. I do mention here that they have two responses in melanoma, which makes me wonder if there's something particular about melanoma that these molecules could respond to better than all of the other types of cancers that have been recruited to this trial. So I think that's kind of interesting. And then they are moving to continue with the higher dose, 12 mg per kg, and they haven't received any dose limiting toxicities yet, even though with these kinds of oncology trials, there are side effects that come with it, but they're not dose limiting yet. So for that reason, I'm hopeful, even though it's not looking great. If we move on to the molecule that I'm more excited about, SL154, this is the SIRP alpha molecule. And in this trial, they're looking at ovarian cancer in particular. It's ovarian, fallopian tube, and I think some peritoneal cancers. So they treated heavily pretreated patients with this molecule. And of the 14 subjects that received it, none of them had a response. They have four of them that had stable disease, giving a disease control rate of what, like 30% or so, maybe less. On its face, it's not great. Now, the spin that I would make though is that the weeks from dose here is not super high for some of the higher doses that were given. Now obviously in dose level three, the one mg per kg, all three of them had progressive disease. With the higher dose level though, level four at three mg per kg, they have one that's stable disease, they have one that's progressive disease, and another one that's still being evaluated. So while this does not look great on its face, most of these patients have been dosed at a subtherapeutic level, and I'm curious to see what's gonna happen. My position is already down around 60% from when I took a little position, so I'm curious to see how this is gonna play out moving forward. And so, in this slide, I'm just reiterating what I said. The highest dose that's been given of the three patients, two to three of them are still being evaluated, and one of them has stable disease so far. So, there is potential, uh, albeit it is a very high risk thing that you know the odds are against Shattuck at this point of them seeing a pretty successful uh, run in ovarian cancer with this molecule. But dose escalation is still continuing at 10 mg per kg. They've not seen any dose limiting toxicities yet. So them continuing to advance the molecule with the higher doses I think is encouraging, even though right now it doesn't look very promising. They do mention that the cytokines are trending in the correct direction, which is nice to see, but that almost makes me more concerned because if they're already seeing things like cytokines in the right direction, as well as high receptor occupancy, I wanna know why they're not actually seeing efficacy. So this actually concerns me more. And I think what the company would argue is that because they're seeing these cytokines and receptor occupancy, eventually as patients are treated for a longer time because as we see here, the average treatment for at least the high dose maybe is 10 weeks or so, which you would expect to see a response by then, but it's really at the cusp. The company would argue that a little more time and they're gonna get these responders. So it remains to be seen, but so far the company has a lot of work ahead of them. So moving forward for Shattuck, I think they're in a tough spot. They seem to be getting good receptor occupancy, so why is there no efficacy? That's the big question here. When they do these measurements of receptor occupancy, you wonder where it's happening. And you know when they're getting this high receptor occupancy, it could be in cells outside the tumor when really they wanna be getting good tumor penetration for those immune cells to do their work. So the receptor occupancy might not be helpful in this case because it's not happening in the right location. I mentioned here, need more time for treatment. And in relation to what I just said, I think that might be a case. So I think there's some room for hope, even though I think it's a long shot. So as I write here, Hopefully another data update with these data sets in the first half of 2021 will show more responses, but they haven't really clarified a timeline, so it remains to be seen. Now, them submitting an IND for AML, MDS, or non-Hodgkin lymphoma has a higher chance of success, but the company decided to move ahead with solid tumors. And for obvious reasons, solid tumors 
are extremely lucrative in an oncology company, but they come with a higher risk. And as we're seeing with Shattuck, they're not able to get a good enough response to excite investors. So going with the solid tumors first is a higher risk, higher reward, but them going into AML now, I think the bar is gonna be pretty low for them, given that they've not seen great activity so far. So they said that they submitted the IND for AML and MDS as a monotherapy or combo with azacitidine or venetoclax, and they're expecting data in late 2022. So we'll see what happens. I think the 2022, they are gonna see a decent amount of catalysts come out because they are registering a lot of trials. They say here that for SL154, there's a phase one clinical trial for squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck or skin, and they're expecting data in the first half of next year as well. So the company is moving forward. And it's just that this early data doesn't look great so far. So I'm gonna continue to hold my position. I'm down quite a bit, like I mentioned. And I might add a little bit more as we get into deeper of 2022, but it's too bad that they weren't able to see that nice efficacy in the solid tumors that they looked at so far. Moving on, I wanna talk about ALX Oncology, ticker symbol ALXO. And they traded on Friday at $38.27 a share giving them a market cap of $1.5 billion. And this is down from $62 or $2.2 billion market cap on November 3rd. So in about a month, they have shaved a ton of value of their company and they're almost approaching their IPO price. The company's Q3 net loss was 24 million and their net assets sit at 375 million, giving them an enterprise value of 1.15 billion. And ALX Oncology is another CD47 company. Their main molecule is called Evorpicept, and it's an anti-CD47 antibody that they're looking at evaluating in solid and hematologic malignancies, and it has an inactive FC. So this is different from your typical CD47 targets where the FC is active, so it promotes more phagocytosis. ALX Oncology decided to make an inactive FC so that they could treat in combination to have the phagocytic activity be uh, mediated by another type of antibody. So what Evorpicept's primary function is, is just to block the CD47 don't eat me signal when they treat into patients. And so they're looking at NHL, AML, MDS in the hematologic area. And then in solid tumors, they're looking at HNSCC, GC, and BC. And so the recent press release that we heard is that they're announcing updated data from ongoing trial Aspen-1 of Evorpicept showing emerging clinical benefits in survival-based endpoints in patients with advanced solid tumors. And so the two big pieces of data here are in gastric cancer as well as head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. So for the gastric cancer trial, they announced a 72.2% objective response rate in these patients that are second line or above HER2 positive gastric or gastroesophageal junction cancer. For the HNSCC cancer, they announced here a 12 month overall survival rate of 87.5% with the median overall survival not reached yet in patients with first line head and neck cancer. And then in patients with second or greater line checkpoint naive head and neck cancer, the 12 month overall survival rate is 80% with the median overall survival of 24.5 months. So we're gonna get into the solid tumor data a little bit more, but I also wanted to mention like a couple weeks before, they released their abstract for ASH that looked at Evorpicept in MDS patients. And the data that was shown there was that in native disease patients, so first line we'll say, five were valuable, and of those they got a 60% objective response, and then in relapsed or refractory patients, five of them were valuable and they got a 40% objective response rate. So the company's stock price decline started with the MDS data release. And the reason for that is that the data presented here, the 60% ORR for ND patients and the 40% ORR in the relapsed and refractory patients, that doesn't look as competitive as a prior CD47 data so megrolimab was 47's molecule, the company was acquired by Gilead, everybody kind of knows this. They had slightly better metrics here. And I think that because it's a smaller trial 
and they only saw 60% and then 40%, investors weren't super thrilled that it came in a bit lower than what megrolimab can do in a similar patient population. Now, I think the difference though is within 10%. So to me, this doesn't bode as a real concern. I think that MDS is a pretty competitive indication already. And the fact that Avorpercept is pretty much in line with megrolimab bodes well, but investors were hoping for greater activity because as the company likes to tout, they have better activity than megrolimab, they have better safety than megrolimab. So I think that because the expectations were a little higher, this is what precipitated kind of the downfall. But for the purposes of today, I wanna to talk more about the solid tumor data because this is way more interesting for all of us. These are very hot indications and they're indications where ALX oncology is gonna be a first in class for this class of molecule. No other molecules are in gastric cancer or HNSCC, that's an anti-CD47 molecule. So what the company did is they provided some data sets that show the standard of care type of efficacy. And for second line or above gastric cancer, we're looking at an objective response rate from 28 to 52% with these different combinations. I'm not gonna read them all, but this is kind of the baseline that patients can expect to achieve if they use kind of standard treatment regimens that are out there. And then what Avorpacept is able to do is in combination with Herceptin, Samraza, and Paclitaxel, they can get a 72.2% objective response. So an almost doubling of the standard of care treatment regimen using Avorpacept. So this is very positive data. I think it bodes very well for the future of the company in a population that has a pretty big total addressable market. So I think that's very exciting. In HNSCC, they do the same thing as with the gastric cancer by showing four trials that we can use as a reference to compare ALXO's data. And what they get here is that in first line, the objective response rate is 36%. In second line or above, it's around 12%. The overall survival rate though, and keep in mind though that the distinction between these different markers or endpoints matter because each one has different value associated to it. So objective response has limitations but it's useful because companies can use it for a single arm data as well as smaller trials. So to wait for 12 month overall survival rate, it's just gonna to take too long. For that reason, oncology companies tend to focus on objective response rate. But when it comes to phase three or registrational trial data, companies usually put their molecule against a control molecule and compare the overall survival rate. So. We prefer to see an overall survival rate than objective response if it's available, but we normally settle with objective response rate because it's become kind of the standard readout for early stage single arm trial data. So with the overall survival rate at 12 months, first line HNSCC sits around 50%, whereas second line and above checkpoint naive sits at around 30%. What ALXO was able to show with Avorpacept is Objective response rate in first line, HNSCC was around 40%, with an overall survival rate at 12 months of 87.5%, compared to the second line and above check checkpoint naive patients that had a 40% objective response rate and an 80% overall survival rate at 12 months. So what this means, and some people might look at this as a bait and switch because the company before focused a lot on objective response rate, and most companies do, but ALX Oncology did the diligence to go ahead and measure the overall survival at 12 months. But what we're seeing here is in second line and above, the objective response is higher, but in first line, it's pretty much in line. The thing is though, they're doubling the overall survival rate at 12 months, which if you're a patient, if you're a clinician and you see that, that is extremely valuable information because you don't really care about an objective response rate of 40% if at 12 months, half of those patients are going to be dead. Compare that to the Vorpicep's data, they're getting 40% that are objective responders, and then at that 12 months, they're seeing 90% of them still survive. So I can't emphasize that this is clinically valuable, even though before the company may have focused on just objective response rate. So, I think this data bodes very positive for the company as well. 
And I think that this recent sell-off is a great buying opportunity. So that's what I plan to do with this. Moving forward, I think that the MDS data is basically in line with prior anti-CD47 therapies. The HNSTC data has potential to be significant improvement over the standard overall survival. And like I mentioned, overall survival is a better measure of efficacy. And I don't think we should really focus on ORR if we don't have to. I think also the gastric cancer data is very promising. So I'm looking to add my position in ALX Oncology. I think that these data are very positive for the company. Now the thing is, there's not a ton of catalysts coming up in 2022, which makes me a little nervous, but I'm into the company already and I think that holding on to them more long term is going to bear fruit eventually. So more MDS data is coming on December 12th for ASH. The data that I presented before is from the abstract only and then on December 12th they're going to have their actual presentation where they go into a little bit more data on their MDS indication. They say in their corporate presentation that in H1 in 2022 they're going to have more data for phase 1 AML with standard of care. Is that going to be a huge mover for the stock? I'm not sure. I think most people care way more about the solid tumor data, and as of now, it bodes pretty well. We don't really have an estimate yet on the timeline for the phase two trial data, but hopefully they're driven to deliver on these endpoints. I think the company overall has been pretty good in delivering on their timelines, and for that reason, I think management has what it takes to continue to push these further and to uh, deliver for shareholders as well. So that's ALXO. Another company that suffered recently, but I think is a good buy on dip, to be honest. All right, I want to finish up today by talking about Biogen. Uh, ticker symbol BIIB, they're trading now at $257 a share, which is a $38 billion market cap, down from around $380 per share. They went higher than that, but I'm just sharing a general idea of where they were when I started taking a position. And at $380 a share, they were at a $60 billion market cap. And this is only mid-2021 when this was the case. So in Q3 of 2021, their net income was $329 million. And this is down 50% year over year. And this is mostly due to a decrease in Tech Federa sales after the litigation outcomes came against Biogen. Generics have come on the market and have eaten a serious amount of their market share. Their net current assets sit at around $3 billion, giving them an enterprise value of $35 billion. And for those who don't know about Biogen, they're a neuroscience company, and they're rapidly losing their MS franchise, which has made up the bulk of their revenue for a really long time. And in the last few months, they've had a pretty rough go of things. I think that's fair to say. And things outside of the Aduhelm situation Almost all of their late stage clinical readouts in 2021 were failures. All of the eye disease, particular readouts, choroideremia and XLRP did not come back positive. And then they had a recent readout in ALS in collaboration with Ionis that did not come back positive. Although I think the company is gonna to try to spin something positive for future trials or something, but the primary endpoints were not met here and a path to registration is not very clear. And these late stage failures, I think could be shrugged off if the bright spots were actually positive. And I think there's reasons to be concerned even with these bright spots. And the few things that have come out that I think are positive for the company, they filed, I believe, the Zoranolone BLA. And this is in collaboration with Sage. I think there's a lot of questions around whether or not this is actually gonna get approved, but they have filed it and they can argue that there's an effect here, but I think the street is probably concerned about this. The next one is Lacanumab, which is band 2401. That's moving forward nicely. ESI has initiated a rolling BLA submission under accelerated approval. And if Aduhelm is any indication, this has a better chance probably of being approved than Aduhelm, even though there's still gonna be questions of clinical efficacy and whether or not insurers are going to pay for it or Medicare is going to cover it. So there's still issues surrounding those things that Aduhelm is dealing with right now with lecanemab, but they are moving forward. And then they have seen some positivity in some phase two trials. And one that I'm bringing up is small fiber neuropathy. They have seen some positive data there. So the other big thing has to do with Aduhelm. So for those who don't remember, earlier in the year, Aduhelm, which is the brand name for aducanumab was approved earlier in the year and this is going to be a big 
blockbuster drug for Biogen. They were going to replace their dying franchises with the revenue that was going to come from one of the first Alzheimer's disease approvals in like 20 years. Now the thing is, with Aduhelm, there's been a narrative, and it is kind of the truth, that they can't match the decrease in amyloid beta concentrations with an improvement in cognitive function. This is the whole debate that Biogen has struggled to prove, and, and really other companies as well, but because Aduhelm has been approved, it's incumbent on them to show that their drug is gonna have a clinical benefit, and this has been the struggle. So the woes that come with Aduhelm, the uptake has been slower than expected. Q2 sales were only 2 million, and then Q3 sales were only 300K. So they're absolutely struggling here. There are huge logistical challenges with starting up an infusion center in these neuroscience clinical practices, and they also have to get the testing homed in because it's not just about a patient showing up with clinical symptoms, they have to be tested, and if they fit that criteria, then they might be able to be treated with Aduhelm. Other stuff that we've seen is that surveys of insurers and MDs are coming back unfavorable. We're seeing certain insurers say that they're not going to cover Aduhelm, and MDs don't want to prescribe it until the NCD decision comes back from Medicare. We've also seen a recent patient death, and this is a 75-year-old patient that was treated with Aduhelm. To be honest, 75-year-olds, sometimes they just die. And this patient happened to be taking Aduhelm. The company's investigating it, but I think that they're probably gonna come up clean because none of this was a real concern in the clinical trials. And I think that you know it's easy to pile on when there's a narrative going against a company or, or a story or a person. So, I think that this just adds to the fear, the uncertainty, and the doubt that is coming with Biogen. Now, some more tangible news though, there was a negative vote on marketing approval from CHMP of the European Medicines Agency for European approval. So this coming back negative is suggesting that they're not gonna get approval for Europe. It wasn't gonna be a huge market to begin with, but approval would have started to change the narrative, and I think that's really the tough part here is that there's so much negativity going into the stock that it's continuing to hammer the price down. And then to top it all off, Alfred Sandrock uh, announced his retirement, and he was a big proponent for Aduhelm. So him leaving is starting to add to the discomfort that investors have with Biogen and continues to contribute to the decline in the price. And that's why we're seeing that a third of the value has basically been lost since mid-2021. Thankfully, there's a few big things coming up. And the one really is that the NCD decision is coming up in January. And this is going to be a massive catalyst. It's going to be the decision on whether or not Medicare is going to be covering Aduhelm and to what capacity they're going to cover Aduhelm. I think that all the negativity associated with the company is starting to price in a negative NCD decision. And so I think that if the NCD is going to cover Aduhelm to any capacity, it will be extremely bullish for the stock. The other thing that's gonna happen is that there's a Tecfidera appeal decision, I believe. It's so tough to find any details on this, but Biogen has filed an appeal on the original ruling against Tecfidera, and if this happens to come up in support of Tecfidera IP for Biogen, this could also ch turn the stock around quite a bit. So there's potential there, and I'm still holding on to my position. It is extremely painful to hold on to a position like this as it continues to get chipped at, but eventually there's gonna be a total capitulation with all of this negative data, and we're gonna end up seeing a slow uptick in the Aduhelm sales, and I think it will turn things around eventually. This is all incumbent on the NCD decision being somewhat positive, so it is dependent on that. So for those who haven't taken a position or thinking about taking a position, you know these are the things to watch for, and I'm gonna be holding on and, and watching in kind. So. That's what I wanted to cover today. I do want to talk about Curious eventually because I think there's a huge opportunity here, but we're coming up we're coming up on time on the show, and I want to try to limit these to around half an hour, so I'm going to wrap it up there and talk about Curious next time. But for upcoming Catalyst, we have a lot to look forward to. Checkpoint, Therapeutics, Curious pushed theirs out to January, which we'll talk about next time. Madrigal has an NAFLD update coming in January. Carrier Farm, another company I want to talk about, has Siendo results pending, and they've seen a bit of a turnaround lately. Clearside has CLS AX Phase 1-2 Oasis data from Cohort 2 coming up before the end of year. 
BioXL PDFA decision is coming in early January, and then I have Biogen with an NCD decision in January, and then ALX Oncology is gonna have more to give in December. So if we do a quick portfolio update, I'm sitting at negative 10 now, year to date, and a lot of this is due to my Biogen position, and then some others that have not gone well. Shattuck, I had only a small position to begin with, so it hasn't hurt too much, but I've seen upsets in YMTX, uh, CYCN has gone against me big time. ALX Oncology also turned against me pretty big. And Curis as well has been kind of a loser for me. But I think there's so much potential in Curis that I might double my position um, because I think 2022 is going to be a huge year for them. So these are all the changes I made. I was lucky to sell BTAI when I did because there was a downgrade on the stock that led to a big sell-off. Clearside I added in the mid fives because I think they still hold a lot of potential. I don't know if I mentioned this already, I sold my 40 molecular therapeutics and that was a hindsight a pretty good trade because they're sitting in the mid 20s and overall the XBI has been getting annihilated and it's been very tough to watch. I'm beating them only by a few percentage points though and this is even with the trillion buyout. So my portfolio has been getting decimated as well. Not as bad as ARC-G though, the bubbly names, the CRISPR names, the, the ARC love fest is turning around for Kathy Woods, so I'm happy to be beating her, even though those names do make up a big portion of the XBI too, so I would prefer that she succeed and we all succeed in kind, but I am doing a little bit better than her and we're just getting totally annihilated together compared to say the NASDAQ or the S&P 500, but it is what it is, I think tax selling season is definitely contributing to this and I'm not the only person to be thinking this but it is going to have this capitulation effect where we're going to see the XBI get a bid eventually probably in late December but we'll see and I'm going to wrap it up there so I want to thank everybody for your attention appreciate all the support let me know what you think am I off on Shattuck am I off on ALXO and am I insane for continuing to hold Biogen I think I might be but I'm willing to let it play out. So that's gonna be the next little while. So thank you everybody, appreciate your time, appreciate your attention. Click the like or subscribe button. And with that, I'm gonna wrap it up and we'll see you next time.